Welcome back, everyone, to theCUBE's live coverage in San Francisco. I'm John Furrier, your host of theCUBE with Savannah Peterson. We're here for two days, wall-to-wall -wall coverage, Databricks' annual event, the Data and AI Summit. Uh, we got a lot of coverage. Uh, two great CUBE alumni coming have been around the block when it comes to data. This segment really gets a look at the historical perspective as well as the cutting edge new foundations that are being laid down and get a glimpse into the future of AI and analytics. Uh, General Jeff Vice, CMO of Impetus Technologies. Welcome back. And on Raman CRO, Chief Revenue Officer of Impetus Technologies. Guys, we've been on the CUBE having conversations from the big data days. Absolutely. Hadoop, Spark Summit. Now this is like Spark Summit on steroids. It's called Data and AI <laughs> Summit. Good to see you. Likewise. All right, Likewise, so let's John. get into it. You guys, you guys have been riding this way for a long time and we've been on this journey together. Big data, Hadoop, again, a lot of things to work on, a lot of complex stack there. Didn't get the adoption, in comes Spark. Databricks takes that, jumps on the next lily pad, starts a data lake movement with more open technologies. Now we got this generation of data now with generative AI where everyone is on a land grab for getting more capabilities. So we're kind of in that, hey, we're finally here. <laughs> Big data made it, moment. <laughs> That's true. We've seen this movie before, Absolutely. but now it's a completely different world. Yes. What's your, what's your reaction to Databricks at this event? I think uh, Databricks has done a fantastic job. Uh, this is, this is we're coming to a place where really now the enterprises are, uh, are able to, to make sense of the data. And you know, we talked about, we internally at Impetus, uh, we have a mission, we created a mission in 2017. We said, how do you create powerful and intelligent enterprise? Mm -hmm. And uh, as we work through that, I think Databricks has been a very significant champion uh, with us in helping enterprises become more in intelligent and powerful. Well, you guys are an elite tier partner of Databricks, which means what? Because they have a lot of partners. What is the elite tier? We're mean? the best. Okay, <laughs> so, so what, scope that for me. Give me an order menu. What does that mean? Level of client work? Is it scope of deals? What, is that, what does that kind of partner level mean? It's a combination of things, uh, what we've done for Databricks. We're one of the oldest partners of Databricks. Uh, we started with them. Uh, we've actually helped them help uh, implement Databricks for many, many customers, do some enterprise-wide adoption of Databricks across, technology, across companies. Uh, but more importantly, I think uh, there are two things that have been really successful. One is, you know, we've built some IP that's helped Databricks uh, consume much, much faster and enable uh, Databricks to really make sure that the enterprises are making use of it and for enterprises from whatever they've signed up with Databricks be able to consume that quicker. So uh, we've been the fastest accelerator for uh, Databricks consumption, if you would. Uh, because we have a tool that helps enterprises migrate off of their legacy platform mm -hmm. and transform all their 20 year, 30 year old code into the new enterprise platforms like Databricks. So you guys have operating leverage, not just service. Absolutely. You bring technology in. Okay, let's, let's, get, let's dig into that if you don't mind. Okay, so sure. the trend clearly is it's been happening for, it's a slow train wreck. Legacy with data warehouses are moving into the cloud and what found these foundational models are driving everything. You can't just do it overnight. You can. Take us through that, that work. What's involved? Are the data engineers doing it? Is it a full platform redo? What's, what's involved in, in, a, in, a, <laughs> in, a, in a migration or a switchover? Uh, fantastic question, and thanks for asking that because that's what our enterprises are, are really dealing with. And since you brought about uh, a subject on history, a 10 <laughs> second, that's where Hadoop kind of failed. They built yeah. a new application, but they couldn't bridge the, uh, help bridge the, uh, that gap between legacy and this. And that's where we saw the, the open gap between the old technology and new, and which started our journey of building uh, this product called Leap Logic. And uh, it's, uh, like, like, like it says, it helps enterprises leap from their legacy world and take that logic as is and bring it and make it work on the new platforms. So yes, it involves data engineering, but what it involves is a lot of R&D that's gone behind in building a product which is 90, gives up to 95% automation for enterprises. So as an example, can you bring that to the Unity catalog? Absolutely, we can bring it to the Unity catalog. And interestingly, you bring uh, Unity catalog to the picture. We've We've actually extended the data warehouse ex, uh, accelerator to even provide uh, migration from uh, Hive Metastore to Unity Catalog. 
And what's the, that doing for Databricks is making enterprises ready for adoption of Gen AI beyond all the governance and security and stuff. And uh, again, getting rid of the, the legacy, moving to the, moving to the world, new world, and enabling them to get, rid for, get ready for Gen AI. So it sounds like there's a lot of picks and shovels in, in the announcements this morning. We saw the you know, mosaic tools are out there. So yeah, people are building a lot of picks and shovels. But what you're talking about foundationally, pour a new concrete resetting the data foundation for the enterprise. Well that's um, a key thing and it's an interesting challenge because you, I know it's an overused term, but you need to have your data foundation um, really, really ready to move into the Gen AI world. And that's easy to say, really, really hard to do, to be able to do that. The lift and shift, shift to the cloud that uh, organizations tried to do is not going to give you that data foundation. You yeah. need to be able to have it be governed, yeah. it needs to be able to be able to be consumed and done in a trusted way. Yeah. And so, uh, well, and you know, only 30% of Databricks customers are on catalog today. So there is a Grand Canyon that we have to get people through, and that what What's interesting about us is there's product companies, there's service companies, there's very few that do both IP and yeah. services. I've worked at both kinds of companies, and the train kind of goes off the track quickly yeah. when you talk to a product company about, great, you have speeds and feeds, but how yeah. do I get there? Yeah. And um, what we're focused on is that join to bring the right automation technology that can do it in a smart way, but then bring the services around it so you can get the job done. Well, it's interesting you bring that up because one, good business right now is having operating leverage with technology, but the service is what the customers need right now because they're dealing with a lot of legacy stuff that you just can't throw away. So migration, I see that as a key thing. So, and plus, all the other um, global service integra system integrators, they're all service-based, it's a service business. Yes. Okay, so the question I have for you is, what makes you guys different? Take us through the differentiators, um, okay, I like what you're saying, sold me on it, but what, what about the other guys? What do they do? I hear the same thing, how are you different? I think fundamentally yeah. there are two things. Uh, when you say difference, as, as Jeff pointed out, we are one of the only companies that brings uh, deep maturity in, in product and uh, as well as services. I think there's one other concept, uh, I'll let you talk about the three E's, uh, but I think uh, when, you, uh, when you bring customer uh, concept of innovation, yeah. reliability, and zero disruption. And you are able to prove that both in the short term and the long term. And that's the reason why customers like us, that's what differentiates us. So you go up, up front, you lay that out up front. We up front lay that out. We have customers for whom we've built solutions and they've won patents on it enterprise customers who uh, filed for patents for the work that we've done and they've won on it. So when you bring that kind of yeah. work to a customer, they know what the value they're bringing. Because data is, every, every IT is turning into a software company today. Yeah, actually one of these customers was good enough to put our engineer's name on the patent submission. And that's not usually what you get from a services that's, that's company. A, that's, a, that's really good. Um, the three E's, since I'm the marketing guy, <laughs> uh, is, is uh, the expertise, the engineering, and the experience. And uh, that may sound like something that everybody can speak to, but it's the join of those three that build up, yeah. that we can look at the most demanding job, whether it's coming from a small company or a big established yeah. credit card company. You have to bring those three together. If you have just two or just one, you're usually yeah, yeah. not going to be terribly successful and you're going to go through a learning curve motion. Oh, so say the three E's again, experience, engineering, and? Expertise. Expertise, okay. So engineering right now I think is critical. One of the things I've seen the past year and a half is engineering chops minimum stakes, table stakes. Yes. Because everything's being looked at from a data perspective and now with generative AI, all the plumbing and pipelining can be automated. So agents are now going to in play. So now, you can't get agents right if you don't get the data right. Right. It's a, yeah. it's a systems redo. I mean, it's a systems architecture, not just data. Absolutely. It's a complete engineering assignment. And that's where I think the experience comes in to me. It's like, but let me rephrase this question. What experience 
it is needed now that's new that wasn't around five years ago? If you could say learnings that are, that are super important for generative AI that weren't around five years ago or so. I, I think uh, if you look at generative AI, the, uh, again there are, there are three E's uh, which kind of become very interesting. It's what is the experience that you give to an end user? What is the economy you bring to the end user? What is the efficiency you bring to the end user? So if you combine those three E's of uh, experience, efficiency, and economy, right? how do you deliver that? Now that wasn't there five years ago. Yeah. How do you interact, interactively interact with data? Yeah. Right, that was, even five years ago, we were still talking about BIs, and as you heard in the keynote today, it's not BI anymore, it's AI BI. Yeah. Right, so you cannot live with static dashboards today. You have to work with uh, the yeah. data interactively, and that's what I think Gen AI brings. But more importantly, as you as enterprises started to look at Gen AI, what is now coming is how do you really govern that? Because governance is going to become very, very important mm -hmm. as you implement Gen AI. Governance we, has come up to the front lines. I mean, I'm seeing, and that's a conversation that was only for a few conferences we go to. But isn't that crazy, it's though? Like, it's like the hottest thing on the planet right now. Yeah. If you don't get it right, you can't let the data fly around. Exactly. Because low latency data is going to be the next big thing. Yes. How do you get low latency data? I just had the New York Stock Exchange ICE technology lead on earlier, um, and we were talking about that. That's a huge factor. I, be huge. I think you hit the nail on the head that you had these group, these categories, that governance was like, the boring people did that, right? That you didn't want to talk to. You know, you would hit, hide when the governance people came because it meant pain and suffering. And now, uh, and then you would say the same thing with the visualization guys and the same thing yeah. with the data guys and the same thing with the apps guys. And then there was the analytics guys. There were all these different groups that formed and usually a shiny light went on one or two of them. Yeah. What's interesting here is there is no, uh, gap where you can just say, you don't have to worry yeah. about that. It's the join bringing them together that this industry has spent the last 15 years yeah. kind of pulling apart to say, you don't have to worry about that. And that is what is either, I think, going to separate the wheat from the chaff. Yeah. The organizations that can understand how these things intertwine together are going to jump ahead. Uh, the ones that don't, they're going to be on the late night news because they recommended their competitor's product you know, in their personalized ad campaign. Yeah. Uh, well, they're going to be on the wrong side of history. They'll be out of business because they won't have a competitive advantage. Yeah. I mean, to me, we were talking on theCUBE, I want to get your reaction to this because I agree with you. You hit a, you hit a great point there. Right now, the general consensus amongst most smart people in technology is like, well, I always ask the question, what's this wave like compared to other waves? Because we've seen some waves, right? Mm -hmm. We've been on many waves. This one is big, and I, I can see what people's reactions. So, a few, I won't name names, because they're pretty big deals, uh, technologists, they don't want their names out there. They said, one said, it reminds me of email. Email and office suite, productivity suite. Because that changed everything. And if you think about email, IT changed because of it. So what you're getting at our earlier point about engineering the, a new foundation, is like saying, hey, we just invented email. That means PCs and desktops are going to have more productivity that you don't have to do other things on. Write down on, on I'm a sorry, screen. what's email? Did I, I haven't <laughs> used that. I, I haven't, is that, what does that do? I have um, so many inbox spam messages now. No, but that changed but, everything. But AI, gen, the Gen AI is going to do something similar where it's going to change the structural. But let me, let me top on, on yeah. a serious note. Because yeah. I've been asked this before, why is this wave different or is yeah. it different? Or is this just another hype cycle? Yeah. In each hype cycle that I've seen, and we don't have to, you know, getting to the cloud, getting to big data, there were, there was inertia. There were companies that it was not in their best interest to have that new wave happen. So you got hybrid computing, right? A little bit of cloud's okay, but you still need a data center, yeah. and et cetera. What is happening now is there is no, there's inertia with legacy hardware, but there are no inertia vendors that are saying, oh no, you don't need AI. There's not somebody sitting back and saying, this might be ill-advised. Everybody, from the smallest to the biggest, mm -hmm. seems to be moving and you could argue AI washing, yeah. but everybody seems to be going, yup, this makes sense. 
and you didn't see that with big data. You had the big traditional database guys holding back. You didn't see that with the cloud. That's why cloud took 10, 15 years. You're not quite seeing that here with Gen AI, because I challenge you to find a company that goes, Gen AI, just a fad, we'll get past this. No, everyone's on board with this. It's obvious, it's just, it's just evolving. It is. I mean, what's your reaction to the wave? No, I, I completely agree with Jeff. I, my sense is, as I said a few minutes ago, you know, Gen AI brings uh, uh, interactivity to interactivity with data like never before. And I think uh, that's what is going to be, and the multimodal uh, aspect of it, yeah. you know, bringing different things together, your voice, your text, your images, your real-time data, your batch data, your 10-year-old data, and all the history and intelligence behind it. I, I think what that serves up, yeah. we, we were all impressed when the Siri's and the Alexa's came up. Yeah. And this is actually a complete next generation of the Siri's and Alexa's. All Alexa. those taglines and then big data days, put your data to work. Yeah. I mean, actually, <laughs> it's in play right now. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so th let's go walk through what you guys are working on right now. You mentioned Logic, Leap, uh, what was it? Leap, Leap, Leap Logic. Leap Logic. What other things do you guys have in your arsenal and your in your toolkit? Give me the give me the give me the, uh, the some of the features that you guys have, the key things for your customers. So uh, Leap Logic is one of the most important ones, and it's our flagship uh, tool where uh, we're working with Databricks and and all the cloud providers. Uh, it's it's one of the only tools, as I said, provides up to 95% of automation, uh, zero disruption to the business, and fail safe. We've done complex of Teradata migrations, complex to complex in record time that people thought they could never ever get rid of. Uh, complex of ETLs, complex of analytical tools, everything now running in a Databricks environment. Uh, so that's one. Uh, you brought up UC migration, so we built Accelerator to move from Hive Metastore to UC migration. Again, uh, one of the only ones that can provide you know, really 2x performance uh, on the UC migration too. Um, and really creating the pathway for, uh, for governance and Gen AI. Okay, so your relationship with Databricks is a good one, elite partner. Um, what are some of the benefits to the customer? How does the pitch go? On the Terra data, you mentioned you guys just like 95, no, no, no disruption, no fails. What's the pitch like? They go, ah, I don't believe you, prove it. Do they not, do they, are they skeptical or they heard word of mouth that you guys are uh, got the product they want to call you in? Take us through a, a day in the life of a sales call. Sure. Not sales call, but like you're know saying. No, I, I completely yeah. understand. And uh, sometimes it is that it's too good to be true. And uh, you know, uh, we have to show it to them. And it's it's very simple. We have a simple web portal where somebody can and put in their uh, 100, 200, 500 lines of Teradata code and it'll spit out a Spark code or it'll spit out a DB SQL code right there. So we in just- turn around time, like instantly? Instantly. Yeah, you and you charge for that? We, uh, no. from a proof of concept, that's free. Okay, so they go, okay, yeah, We magic. have a web portal, yeah, we okay. install it on AWS and Azure, yeah. go and cop, put your 500 lines of Teradata SQL. And migration. then what happens next? They go, what's under the covers? <laughs> so, <laughs> it will assess and tell you what can be done on an automated fashion, what is underutilized, and perhaps you don't have to think about migrating it, and what might need some customization. So you'll get an assessment report that'll size that, that'll go through that, and that'll allow you to allow us to size the project, let you know what is involved, and then uh, allow you to be able to Make it so you show them the decisions. power tools, and then they go, okay, great, then you go through classic migration, consulting, okay, assessment, with transformation, we got to that operationalize. But all of this is automated though. Yeah, the tool does the assessment. All of this is, assessment is automated. The tool does all assessment, there's we, no service? We do the assessment, we were meeting with a CIO of a bank yesterday, where we did the assessment and he came to meet us. He said, this is the first time I know of my own application environment much better than uh, I've ever known because your assessment tool told me what's being used, yeah. what's not being used, what's junk, what's technical debt, and what really needs to get migrated. So what's the secret sauce? Years of experience that goes into training the tools, uh, and is it learn on its own? What, give us a, a peek into the IP or the we've, secret sauce. We've migrated about nearly billion plus lines of code today. Right, so the, the product has become intelligent in its migration, and it understands, we don't do a line by line code migration. 
which many others in the, in the competition do that. We understand patterns of how people write code and what pattern should focus where. And in the, while we are understanding patterns, we also look at how these patterns have to run in the new environment. So the, when we transform, the optimization and performance optimization of that pattern automatically happens. So what the customer gets is, if they're spending a million dollars on Teradata, when they come to the cloud, they won't, they'll either spend a million dollars or probably spend 900K. So you get, the, you get good cost optimization. Absolutely. So you give them a good, so that makes them feel good. They don't know they're going to overspend, so they get a good feel for what the impact is. And the return on investment is much better. Yeah, TCO. Jeff, I mean, you got to look at this, you got to go, this is kind of too good to be true. How do you sell through that? How do you market that? Just, just say. <laughs> oh, you don't have it. to market, it's, it's so good. <laughs> um, it's, Word uh, of mouth's got to be well, big. Well, actually, I mean, what, what I hear a lot from the customers is we're admittedly a well-kept secret. And uh, often I've worked for companies that had great marketing and maybe not so great product, or product that wasn't quite ready for prime time. The situation with Impetus is the reverse. Yeah. Um, they've actually created a real, real differentiation and now it's about just telling yeah. the story. The market, has moved into our sweet spot. Yes. So we're hopping in this wake now. By the way, data engineering is what we do. So we're not, we're not yeah. spreading out and taking any SI project. If you want to install an HR system, yeah. there's lots of other vendors on the show floor we could point you to. Our passion, our yeah. focus you guys is are, around data you, you engineering You guys are like the, the fixer. You come in and you're going to clean up some stuff and reset the foundation because this wave is a disruptive enabler. Okay, it's going to enable, but it's going to disrupt things. There's going to be old way and new way pretty soon. We're going to start, as you pointed out, the side of the street, old way and new way. And it's, be, it's becoming clear. In fact, um, the fog is kind of lifting a little bit. Say, so, okay, data warehouse, we all know what's going on there. I mean, Holly basically said on his keynote, fragmented data estates. He's yeah. talking directly at yeah. what you're doing, right? Yeah. <laughs> that straddling <laughs> is the hardest thing to do. Every VC backed startup and high flying company is pretty good about saying we got the next best thing. We got the next best mousetrap. Nice. Um, the thing is, nobody's a greenfield. Everybody's starting with something, no matter how small you are, and the trick is how do you get from where you are to where you're trying to get to, and that's the spot we, uh, we occupy. And it must be raining money, chief revenue officer. Clients are happy, they got a great tool to migrate, probably which is a real pain point for them. I mean, this is probably a pain point that you help make go away. I think the pain, for, for us, uh, the pain point that we are helping them go away is you know, reliance on all the legacy systems. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's, that's one of the most important thing. And the second pain point that we, as we meet with so many different new customers every day is, you know, how do I really make sure that my data strategy or data infrastructure is ready for the future? Well, congratulations, um, you guys got a good opportunity. Put a quick plug in for the last 30 seconds we have left. What are you guys looking to do here at Databricks Beyond? What's, what's next for the company? Give uh, the pitch. Uh, no, I think uh, the next for the company is definitely Gen AI. There's a strong, very, very strong push on Gen AI. With our experience with, uh, with uh, data engineering, I think we're setting ourselves up and setting our customers up for Gen AI. I think there's, as you've said, there's a lot more. It's a transformative journey. Uh, we're getting ready for it and we're uh, ready to help our customers on it. And, and I'll give a plug on top of that is one thing we have are these data and Gen AI labs. They're for qualified uh, clients, they're free. It's a couple days getting together. It's looking at the strategy and design to be able to figure out which way you want to go from an objective uh, standpoint. And that's something that we offer. We get a lot of uptake in that and it allows you to go from talk to actually put a uh, kind of pen on paper, if you will, and get something that could be a blueprint for your future. Well, Jeff, and uh, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Gonna go back, 2015, Spark Summit, that's eight, <laughs> nine years ago. <laughs> that's right. Nine years ago you were on. I mean, if you go, go back and look at that video, I mean, that was the beginning. This is all on a trajectory, yes. a little bit higher evolution, but yes. uh, just we're feeling good right now. Absolutely, Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you very right. much. We're here live in San Francisco, the Cube Databricks event. I'm John Furrier, your host with Savannah Peterson. We'll be right back after this short break. <laughs>